A very warm welcome and good morning from India to everyone watching this. We are here today for the AIOS IOC 2024 and we begin this morning of the third day of this conclave with the third letter of the English alphabet that is C for cornea. Welcome all. It's the today's topic is infectious keratitis, state of art diagnostics and management. It's over to Dr. Bupesh to conduct the further proceedings of this session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Subha and uh, all in the Optimist Society for uh, this interesting session. And uh, the session will be uh, for one and a half hour and uh, will be chaired by Dr. Savitri Sharma, who certainly uh, doesn't need any introduction. She is a at present network director amateurs of entire microbiology and lab services at LB Prasada Institute. And uh, she is, uh, I think, mentored all of us in uh, in our ocular microbiology. And she has published a lot of papers and guided us and performed a lot of research projects. So Dr. Savitri Sharma will uh, chair this session and introduce a few of her uh, speakers. Dr. Savitri Sharma. Hello, good morning, everyone. And morning. what is it for Elmer and uh, Guillermo? Good night. <laughs> good midnight, thank you, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Elmer and Guillermo, for joining us. And uh, for us from India, uh, you are really uh, very important for us in the field of infectious keratitis. We can't do without you. Uh, very nice topics have been chosen in this uh, session. Uh, I think uh, Bhupesh has uh, taken a lot of pain to do that. And uh, we'll be uh, having talks by uh, different people. I think we have already said 10 plus 4 minutes uh, for each one. And beginning with uh, uh, Dr. Elmer Tu, who will talk to us on in vivo confocal microscopy. Uh, in the diagnosis and management. This session will be uh, focusing on diagnostic methods, uh, both uh, what is existing and uh, what is the future of that, as well as uh, management methods. And, and I, I hope the people who have joined the uh, symposium will uh, learn from that and uh, will appreciate the uh, knowledge that will come from this. I thank everyone again, and I give it back to Bhupesh to moderate this session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Savitri. So to start with, uh, can someone please uh, start the sharing the screen of Dr. Elmer's presentation? And uh, it is my kind uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Elmer. Dr. Elmer, too, is always a good friend and good mentor for me personally. But he is the Joel Sugar Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology and Director of the Cornea and External Disease Section in University of Illinois, Chicago. And he's an expert consultant to FDA Ophthalmic Devices Panel. And he has been associated with various societies like OMIC, Cornea Society. And he has been executive editor to Cornea, AGO, and member of so many other journals. He's presented more than uh, 100 book chapters and he's having more than 25 years of experience of uh, cornea and infectious diseases and has been always instrumental in teaching us and coming you know, our meeting bugbusters and we always uh, thanks for that. So can please uh, someone share, start sharing the presentation and he's kind enough to be awake in this midnight. Please start. Greetings. My name is Elmer Thiel from the University of Illinois. I am here. In Raise the Illinois. increase the volume, please. Thank you to the organizers, Dr. Bashant and others, for including me in this wonderful session. My topic today will be the value of in vivo confocal microscopy in infectious keratitis. My financial disclosures are displayed below and are not relevant to today's talk. Uh, make it maximum, huh? Why aren't you masked? Who are these people? I don't know. What the hell is that? What are you doing? of the middle meningeal artery. What's your degree in? Dentistry? 
How do you explain slow and pulse, low respiratory rate and coma? Fundoscopic examination. Fundoscopic examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. Oh my God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. 50 years later, this uh, promise of point of care testing where medical diagnosis are, diagnostics are provided at the place and time of care, providing real-time results, allowing real-time modifications in care, and improving prognosis remains elusive. There have been a number of systemic strategies uh, that have been used that are now being applied to ophthalmology and external disease, including antigen antibody detection as well as enzyme activity as an indirect measure of surface infections. For many years though, we've had at our disposal as cornea specialists, diagnostic imaging tools that can approach the specificity and sensitivity of these other point of care tests. Something that we have in all of our offices are the Sloan Pyrop microscope, which offers in vivo microscopy at high magnification and also provides optical sectioning, which allows the clinician to determine the depth of lesions, the contour, as well as the density. As we're all familiar, uh, bacterial keratitis normally uh, presents as a necrotic single colony lesion while fungal keratitis normally presents as an elevated lesion here uh, or with a fimbriated edge or satellite lesions. Acanthamoeba keratitis, however, normally shows less necrosis and has a firm, smooth bed. Here you can see the epithelial cysts with a characteristic clear margin at the limbus. Radial keratoneuritis is seen here as pathognomonic uh, for acanthamoeba keratitis, with most being able to recognize a characteristic ring infiltrate or central corneal ulceration in the later stages. Utilizing the slant fiber microscope, clinicians were able to correctly predict culture positivity in 92%, were, but were unable to determine the species or uh, type of infection in the majority of patients. Significantly hampering prediction were things like prior antibiotic use and corticosteroid use. With the proliferation of anterior segment OCT, investigations have been underway to look at its utility uh, in infectious keratitis. It is important to understand that the shorter wavelength sources will give you better corneal resolution. Some of the applications that have been looked at include uh, in CMV endotheliitis, where you can see here the characteristic endothelial excrescences uh, described by Dr. Kobayashi et al. And in discerning retrocorneal plaques from posterior keratitis, where a retrocorneal plaque seen here would be more characteristic of fungal keratitis, where this may be a deeper uh, bacterial keratitis. And in fact, you can see um, interface infections uh, as visualized here um, after DMEC. Confocal microscopy, however, is unique in its applications for infectious keratitis. There are significant limitations to an optical system, uh, including movement and light scatter. As you get closer and closer to a lesion, it becomes more and more difficult to discern individual cells, which is essentially like finding Waldo in a complicated uh, cartoon. Confocal microscopy provides on-face imaging, uh, as you can see here in the right, and achieves this by uh, the transmission of light and de detection of the reflected image at the same focal plane at the same time. And this reduces lateral and axial light scatter, much like having a stop action photograph as seen here. It represents a significant alternative to corneal biopsy with high magnification and unfussed imaging with real-time imaging being possible with blood flow and dynamic imaging. Limitations are similar in that patient cooperation and movement, denser opacities are not penetrable by most light sources, um, and there can be imperfect depth measurements and limited intraocular penetration. 
the most common finding are spots. And it's un important to understand uh, when imaging this that the plane of cut uh, it will determine the size and the nature of a particular uh, intracorneal lesion. In the upper right, you can see the difference between wild wide field photography and confocal, where the light is limited, allowing much higher resolution. In evaluating these lesions, it's important to think about size, location, number, and pattern. In looking at size, uh, these are the atypical organisms that are normally more difficult to diagnose. Bacteria being too small uh, for direct visualization, Nacanthomyosis, Fusarium, and yeast down below. Patterns of bacterial keratitis are detectable, however. You can see this is a patient with an infectious crystalline keratopathy where you can see extension from a surface lesion ends a biofilm formation into the corneal stroma. And here, although very small, these are candida lesions seen in an interface keratitis, confirmed here in expanding or magnifying that image to the club-shaped appearance of candida that's characteristic uh, for yeast. Location is also very important. And the confocal microscopy allows a Z-scan, uh, which can give you the depth of a lesion based on the um, progression of a motor uh, going back and forth through the cornea. This employs the technique where the multiple scans are taken throughout the cornea, and depending on where it is in relation to other structures, you can tell a depth of a lesion. And here you see images of a normal epithelium and oblique sections allowing you to localize lesions to the basilar cells. Specifically with acanthamoeba keratitis, you can see here in uh, Geme sustain on the right of uh, characteristic cysts, and its corresponding appearance on confocal microscopy, you can see these target cysts here. This is a non-nutrient agar plate on the left, and in the corresponding corneal lesions that you see on the right. These halo cysts may either have a negative center or a positive center. You may also have bright white opacities, or, which are characteristic of older units, as well as the target cysts that you can see here. Characteristic for the slit lamp uh, confocal microscope are these coffee bean appearance uh, of acanthamoeba cysts. And you can see here a correlation between uh, wet mount, uh, the pathology, and an actual confocal of the same lesion. We studied the validity of using confocal microscopy in acanthamoeba keratitis as part of our outbreak in the early 2000s. And you can see here that culture was really not an appropriate um, gold standard, only identifying a minority of cases. But using a composite diagnosis, including confocal microscopy, increased the sensitivity, specificity, and more importantly, the positive predictive value of confocal microscopy. In fact, uh, recent studies have suggested that confocal microscopy remains high, more highly sensitive and more highly specific than even PCR or, and certainly, corneal. Confocal microscopy may have greater utility in fungal keratitis, where you may often have very subtle lesions, as you see here. The imaging of these will show the characteristic septate branching, uh, very thin structures, characteristic of hyphae. And here is a Heidelberg uh, confocal showing the mesh of uh, fusarium keratitis in a cornea here. And this is a patient with a Bassiana uh, bovaria keratitis which shows a very characteristic random branching and septate hyphae that were confirmed on gene sustain and culture. The utility of confocal microscopy from fungal keratitis has been confirmed with high sensitivity and specificity values um, from experienced observers. There's also been descriptions of microsporidia keratitis here, seeing the very small microspores in the corneal stroma as well as amphithium uh, keratitis, uh, showing the broader-based kelp-like uh, appearance of the lesion. Confocal microscopy has also shown some utility in the diagnosis of CMV endotheliitis, with scans showing characteristic uh, multinucleated cells on the endothelium, as well as a characteristic owl-eye appearance of endothelial KP. So in summary, the clinician cannot rely on any single modality for diagnosis, 
in any atypical keratitis, you have to consider the clinical history as well as apply appropriate diagnostics. In corneal infections, we do have the advantage of diagnostic imaging, uh, both slit lamp biomicroscopy and OCT, but only confocal microscopy provides size, location, number, and pattern that can, has been validated for the diagnosis of many atypical keratinities. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention today. I wish you a best, the best of conferences. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tu, for a uh, wonderful presentation. So is there any question to Dr. Tu from any of the panelists? Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Bupesh, can I ask him? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Meena. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Elmer, uh, good evening to you. Uh, so I'd like to know if you are still going ahead with doing microbiology for acanthamoeba, are you or only relying on confocal? And if not, how would you advise us to go about the microbiology of acanthamoeba, now that you've shown a very good uh, um, outcomes with uh, confocal-based uh, treatment? No, we still do microbiology, and uh, um, I'm sure Savitri is happy to hear about that. But um, no, we do uh, continue to use um, a more composite diagnosis. So confocal, I think, is very important. Um, but because nothing is 100%, um, and it's so critical to diagnose these patients with atypical keratitis, which may require commitment to treatment, that we do everything we can to gather as much proof as possible as to what the um, underlying organism is. So we still do, I, I will tell you, however, we don't biopsy very often anymore because uh, we're usually fairly successful uh, either with superficial uh, cultures and the confocal uh, we have found the biopsies to be of limited benefit. So I think that that's probably the major thing that confocal microscopy has uh, allowed us to avoid. Okay. Any other uh, question from any other panelist? Uh, just a question from my side that when we are, uh, when we are uh, doing confocal for fungal keratitis and pythium, uh, we know the characteristic uh, changes or the deviations from the normal fungi high fever we get. And uh, what I see that it is very similar to that we get in confocal. Uh, what is your experience, Dr. Tu? I have very little experience with Pythia. <laughs> so we don't we don't see that very much here. I mean, certainly the images do seem to be quite different um, you know, once you understand the difference uh, between fungal high fever, which tend to be much more slender, uh, much more bland, uh, um, branching uh, with the septate. Uh, so I think that it is discernible, and I think that you all probably have much more experience with that than I do, but uh, I do think it's a good distinction. Yeah. Can so I ask that question to Dr. Tu? Is are going on, so I think we'll get to know some some factors that how to differentiate from fungus versus python, because only one paper that said that is no difference, but actually there are differences are there. Yeah, who is asking? Dr. Paras? Yeah, I, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, to Dr. Tu that there are uh, people who are uh, clinically, like, you know, I mean, practicing in a solo practice or smaller uh, practice basis. They don't have an access to IVCM. So how would you advise them to, you know, I mean, collate that information from microbiology, clinical presentation, and the other features to arrive to the diagnosis? As you said, that biopsy has a very limited role comparatively as compared to uh, doing an IVCM and confirming the diagnosis of acanthamoeba keratitis. Thank you for the question, Dr. Paris. I think that uh, certainly you should make friends with someone with a confocal if you can. <laughs> it's always uh, helpful. But no, I agree. It's, uh, it is it is a little more challenging that way. Um, but I think that you know, with, a, with good microbiology, I think that you can get a fair amount uh, of feedback. Now, you know, we've had a confocal since, you know, 19, or actually 2001 or something like that. And um, I did my own scrapings and, and stains. So I was able to look at the histologic specimens, you know, correlated with the confocal. And over time, my reliance on the confocal has become less. I'm more sure of my clinical examination, um, you know, based on that sort of immediate feedback. So I think that, uh, over time and being a good clinician uh, can 
sometimes supplant the need for a confocal. Uh, in many cases, and all of you I know have much uh, a rich experience, unfortunately, with infectious keratitis. So um, I don't think it's a, an absolute that you need a confocal, but I think it can be helpful in selected cases. But I think as you see them more as a clinician um, and you get the feedback, you know, with positive cultures or positive scrapings, that eventually your clinical acumen will be much better as well. So, so yeah, sometimes when we do a repeat scraping, we do get the organisms on the scrapes when we don't have an access to an IBCM. Of course. Thanks, yeah. Dr. And, uh, yeah, that's why I, I believe that microbiologists help clinicians to learn their clinics properly. <laughs> no yes, argument. I fully agree to that. <laughs> and do you think uh, there's a rule of uh, on follow-up also on confocal means? Uh, I, I have seen cases which are uh, resolved clinically, but are plenty of cysts underlying the posterior stroma. There are no symptoms. So do you think that guided treatment based on confocal is also a good thing or this is overkilling? I um, I honestly, in practice, do not commonly do follow-up exams with confocal microscopy, especially in acanth amoeba keratitis. Fungal, yeah. I think, may be some help. But um, because the bodies of the cysts remain there, I, I think that it's often confusing uh, when you look at a confocal later. Um, I even wonder about the utility of repeat scrapings, actually, because you know, as the organism gets de gets deeper, I think its recovery, regardless of PCR or culture, becomes less and less. So, uh, generally, once I use it as a diagnostic tool, I very seldom use it as a a, 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 a tool for clinical management. Thanks, Doctor Two, and uh, thanks for uh, panelists for all the questions, Doctor Savitri. Uh... Uh, you will start sharing your. You start sharing your screen, Dr. Savitri. Yes, doing that. So I already introduced Dr. Savitri. You can start directly. Uh... Yeah. So my topic is uh, where do we stand today with routine microbiology tests? I know that uh, we are hearing more and more uh, these days about the talk, whether it's time for the uh, next generation molecular tests to take over the routine microbiology tests, uh, which uh, probably is not uh, uh, as sensitive as uh, we would like it to be. Uh, but um, from my talk, you will see that uh, we are still not really ready to give it up, though we would like to uh, test it along with the molecular tests and other uh, imaging technology that was just talked about and then uh, try to decide probably it will, it will be one day a decision will be made collectively by the ophthalmologist to decide whether to give up uh, with the uh, routine tests and they are good enough uh, to make a diagnosis and treat without its help. So that will be left to actually uh, uh, clinicians to do that. Maybe someday it will happen. But right now I'll take you through what we do uh, to make a diagnosis in um, infectious keratitis, which can be caused by a variety of organisms. You can even see a, a parasite uh, uh, sitting uh, in the center, uh, which we have started seeing. And I remember Manisha presenting uh, uh, keratitis cases uh, caused by uh, this particular parasite. So uh, what do we have? Clinically, you can say uh, either a non-viral or viral keratitis. And we use a variety of methods, uh, starting with direct microscopy, because that is the fastest and the uh, most uh, uh, quickly that we can give a diagnosis. Culture, which takes some time. Antigen detection methods are very uh, rarely used in virology. We do use that and uh, molecular methods. A clinical correlation has to remain central to whatever tests uh, that we do in the laboratory. Uh, this is just to show that a patient who was treated uh, for a long time on antivirals and steroids uh, came with uh, and was having ring infiltrate with crystalline edges and was thought to be either fungal or acanthamoeba. And what we saw in just direct smear, which was stained with gram stain, showed unstained uh, beaded appearances here. And then we thought that there must be something else here, which is not seen in gram stain properly. 
and we took the same smear to do acid fast staining and you can see the mycobacteria a very large number numerous of those uh, in the in the one single field also uh, so the patient was treated with amikacin so this takes us hardly one hour so if a laboratory is uh, uh, equipped uh, with uh, staining methods and people to look at the smears, that's the uh, fastest way of uh, making a diagnosis, which would be very useful to the patient. Culture methods, which I said take some time, uh, can be uh, many. We can take uh, different types of media mentioned here. And even the direct microscopy methods can include uh, several methods based on the uh, comfort of the laboratory and the expertise available. Other samples, other than cornea scraping, uh, we, of course, uh, the first sample that we like to collect is the cornea scraping, which is done in the clinic. The technician or somebody takes all the material required for that and scrapings are taken. We prefer with a blade. It can be taken with many other things, but not with a swab, which will actually uh, dry up the uh, sample and uh, the sample is too small. It will get lost in that. Uh, apart from that, we can collect other things which may be related to the uh, uh, risk factors of the corneal ulcer that the patient uh, presents with, and they can also be tested. Uh, we in our laboratory for years now, I can say for almost uh, uh, maybe 30 years, we have been using calcofluoride mixed with calcofluoride. Not, not just potassium hydroxide, but mixing it with calcofluoride. And that makes the organism, as you can see here, it is hardly seen uh, because it is unstained. But to trained eyes, they can be easily seen. Uh, once uh, we add calcofluoride, you and you have you need a fluorescent microscope for that. So that's a bit expensive. Uh, but once you have that, it makes the diagnosis very easy. You can see acanthamoeba cysts and fungal filaments are very, very clearly in uh, this method. I did mention about uh, acid fast stain, but there is another organism which is very easily picked up that is called nocardia. And you can use the uh, only difference is we use 1% acid rather than 20% acid. And you can see them very clearly too. And this is the same repeat of the acid fast uh, stain of mycobacteria. And these are just to again show how a KOH preparation and calcofluoride look different. In gram stain also you can see fungus. So we, that's why because of this we just have a combination of KOH with calcofluoride and gram stain. Two stains that we always do with corneal scrapings. We have added a third one that is Japan blue. Uh, which uh, in our secondary centers where it is not possible to have a fluorescence microscope, we can add some color to the scraping uh, by adding trypan blue, which is available to the ophthalmologist. They use it for uh, a capsular excess cataract surgery and the leftover dye can be directly placed on the cornea scraping uh, without KOH. There's no need, uh, if you mix with KOH, it actually um, gets... Uh, uh, crystallized and uh, precipitated. So we prefer not to add the KOH. And so we can have one smear with just KOH and the other one with trypan blue. And this is how the filaments get stained with that. And the, it is easier because it is ophthalmologists who look at the corneal scrapes in the satellite centers. When we do culture, it, it's very important to remember certain criteria which are required to uh, use for determining whether the growth is significant. So when the growth is in on the solid media in large amount, that is called confluent growth, or growth in more than one medium, or there sh must be consistency in what you see in smear and the culture. Or anything different uh, will have to be thought over carefully before interpreting that. And sometimes corneal scraping, we may be able to get another one uh, in case of a dilemma. Culture gives you the organism, live organism for doing the antibiotic susceptibility, which is not possible by any other method. Culture's identification is a job of uh, microbiologists, but, but uh, ophthalmologists should learn a little bit about that so that they can see that uh, there is consistency in the reporting. So you can identify aspergillus with the green color here, which will say it is aspergillus flavors. Fusarium does not have green color. It will produce pinkish color or uh, just cream color. And we always identify by looking at the 
microscopic picture of the colony. Here you can see alternate area. And this is just uh, to show that sometimes the filaments are brown in color, indicating a dermataceous ulcer. You can see here the corneal ulcer is brown in color. And that usually says that the fungus involved there is a dermataceous fungus. Uh, it is only for identification purpose. Treatment-wise, probably you use the same uh, uh, natamycin for that, but they do respond better than fusarium and aspergillus. Candida is uh, uncommon in India, but quite common abroad. Uh, it is not very difficult to identify in gram stain, also in calcofluoride. That's why these two uh, types of staining that we do, and they're easy to grow in culture on SDA. We did talk about pythium uh, when we reported in uh, uh, 2015. Uh, we were very excited to see the zoospores, but what I want to say is formation of zoospore is not really essential for diagnosis. Uh, it is uh, what we need to learn in the direct smear that aseptate, broad, uh, thick, uh, long filaments are seen and culture on blood agar can also grow within two days. It's not a slow growing organism, it grows. And in two to three days, you can see very thinly spread, not rising above the surface, flat, uh, transparent or uh, slightly brownish colonies and uh, you can if you your laboratory can have the expertise you can do the zoospore formation but not really required for uh, uh, diagnosis. Microsporidia we saw in the confocal I think they are too small uh, for the confocal but in gram stain and calcofluoride they are very beautifully seen without any doubt and normally they are in large numbers because they grow intracellular uh, they will be in clumps and it's easier to identify if they are in clumps. Sometimes microbiologists do confuse them with bacteria, uh, but once you are used to it, you will be able to, you can see that the bacteria will not have uh, uh, this kind of edges uh, that you are seeing and there is a small dot inside. So you need to get used to it uh, to not confuse with bacteria. Acanthamoeba is absolutely clear in whether it is a KOH or whether it is a gram stain. Uh, we can see them very clearly and we saw the very nice pictures in confocal as well. The growth of uh, acanthamoeba is always on non-nutrient agar and we don't see colonies. You have to see them under the microscope. And this is just a picture at 4x uh, actually. 4x is very small magnification. You can see clumps of cysts of acanthamoeba growing on the surface of NNA. Yeah, white tech has now become very uh, common in most of the laboratories and some cities are able to uh, afford uh, Maldi-Toff for identification of organisms as well. So limitations I already mentioned, direct smear as well as uh, cultures of course have uh, slow and uh, they take time. And we are also seeing that large number of, uh, in this publication, we have shown that negative cultures are actually increasing with time. And we are uh, seeing less and less of culture positive keratitis. Also, our uh, uh, microbiome studies have shown that you can find large number of uh, uh, fungal DNA uh, in the fungal keratitis cases compared to uh, culture, which is uh, much less in number. So sensitivity is low. And these are the diagnostic methods by molecular methods will be described by, uh, by the next speaker. Uh, Arpan will be talking about that. This is just to show that they are very sensitive and they do have a great future. They rule out infective etiology because they are very, very sensitive. They are very specific. So they give a definite diagnosis and they confirm unusual organisms. We had confirmed our pythium using the DNA sequencing and confirm the presence of organisms which are difficult to grow. So with this, I thank you for your attention. And uh, do we answer questions now or for yeah, 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 yeah. I think, uh, thanks Dr. Saitri, you such a nice uh, lecture. Do we have any questions to Dr. Saitri by any of the panelists or Dr. Two is still joining? Uh, can I ask a question, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, sure. please. 
it's a wonderful talk as ever. We are always mesmerized when it comes to uh, microbiology and Dr. Savitri. And definitely we all have learned keratitis from you, ma'am. So uh, my, uh, my question would be uh, very uh, basic, I would ask for. Uh, how many, what is the percentage when you go to the molecular level when it comes to that or... Uh, some most of the time we know that clinically it is responding and we stick to our diagnosis and it goes further. I mean, uh, one is like a curiosity that we want to know that whatever is coming negative, we should find out or is it case-based? So I think it is case-based because uh, we uh, whenever it comes negative and you have a strong clinical suspicion, we would like to do the molecular and then find out if it matches with your uh, clinical suspicion. And it will be meaningful. You know, at that time, it will be meaningful. But because we can't go on doing, as you saw in microbiome study, there are so many large number of fungi. So you don't know what to treat and which is the real one. Uh, so we are still at the learning stage in correlating the clinical with the molecular test results. So it should be case by case. Uh, and for Pythium, are we doing uh, sensitivity studies now? Just Yes, yes. It's very easy to do. We are doing, we have done for now hundreds of, I think, uh, 200 or above uh, cases we have already done. My Our lab in uh, Hyderabad is doing every time it grows Pythium and they're able to see the zoo spores. We use a zoo spore for doing the uh, antibiotic uh, susceptibility. But recently in one of the lectures, uh, I think... Uh, Neelam Sapra from she's in Delhi or somewhere she is doing just with the culture also uh, but I don't have experience doing with the filamentous part of the uh, vitium we do it with a zoo spore we get a uniform suspension with that it's just like this diffusion for bacteria thank you so much ma'am thank you Okay, so uh, I think we can go to the next talk by Dr. Appan. Dr. Appan, you can start sharing your uh, yeah, sure. slides. Yeah, Arpan is a rising star in microbiology. He's a pathologist. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's MD pathology, but doing a very good job at Shroff of doing microbiology and pathology. Uh, he is the, uh, I think, uh, now director of uh, laboratory services uh, at the institute. And uh, I find him very, very enthusiastic. And it's a pleasure to talk to him and interact about the cases that we see. We are published together. And it has been a pleasure, Arpan. Actually, I was going to, I had to cut my molecular uh, <laughs> to accommodate you. <laughs> at the last minute, I removed all my uh, later slides. So, welcome. And please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Dr. Prashangar and Dr. Bhupesh to give me this opportunity. While I show the first slide, I do would definitely like to highlight the role of clinical correlation and microbiology, though my talk is centered around molecular biology and newer techniques. So some of the organisms are latent. They may not grow in conventional microbiology tests. The amount of sample available could be less. It's not only the organism which are fastidious and extremely slow growing. It's also the technique of corneal scraping or as we say, pre-analytical methods that could cause non-representative of improper sampling. It's extremely important to have better techniques for all of these. Studies of PCR and culture and KOH have shown different sensitivities, which Dr. Savitri also highlighted. PCR, a little bit basic about PCR. It's a rapid, highly sensitive enzymatic assay. It enables amplification of targeted DNA within a DNA sample. So there are some key ingredients required, a template DNA, predetermined primers, nucleotides, and of course, the enzyme, the DNA polymerase. There are repeated cycles of denaturation, annealing, elongation, with replication of the targeted DNA sequencing, generating billions of copies of the targeted DNA, which are read out. It has been explored in profiling antimicrobial susceptibility and resistance. Real-time PCR 
or quantitative PCR allows analysis of a number of targeted DNA in real time while monitoring at the level of fluorescence. PCR in acanthamoeba keratitis, loop-mediated isothermal amplification has been used for this. We also saw the extreme role of confocal and clinical correlation in this. So I guess a, a, a whole process of combining all these, apart from the apart from the clinical examination, is what is really important. It has a sensitivity of between 71 to 100%, with a specificity which is very high and above 95%. PCR also been used in herpes simplex keratitis as well as herpes zoster keratitis. There are other PCRs, a nested PCR, which uses two sets of primers, two successive PCR reactions. It improves the detection sensitivity and specificity. Multiplex PCR, as is clear from the name, amplifies different DNA sequences simultaneously. And of course, the reverse transcriptase PCR which amplifies complementary DNA that are derived from an RNA sample. So 18S, the core component of a 40S, is used for fungi and acanthamoeba, while the 16S, the core component for the 30S, which is highly conserved in bacteria, is used for PCR for bacterial keratitis. Deep DNA sequencing for pathogen detection also detects foreign DNA within a sample and may allow discovery of novel pathogens. Techniques utilizing biomes, Dr. Chavitri already highlighted this, has the potential to cheaply and rapidly identify known and unknown organisms. An interesting pathway which has been being talked about is the clinical metagenomic NGS or the next generation sequencing. It allows for rapid, massive parallel sequencing of DNA and RNA. It significantly increases both the efficiency and the quality of sequencing, significantly thus reducing the cost. It's a short read sequencing, a rapid sequencing with quicker reads at the expense of a reduced comprehensiveness. A long read sequencing or the whole genomic sequencing has a higher resolution. It facilitates the, in the study of antimicrobial resistance as well as for gene disease transmission and potential outbreaks. The NGS has demonstrated the promise in augmenting clinical microbiology as well as public health practice and its applic applicability is now also increasing in traction in infective keratitis. NGS is able to yield positive results in culture negative IK cases. So probably that would be the way to go as Dr. Savitri said Maybe a combination of the of clinicians, ophthalmologists, microbiologists sitting together and realizing, is this the way to go? Probably now. In whereas the infectious bio burden when it's low, and it also has a utility when it's caused by atypical uh, organisms and fungi. And of course, with a quicker TAT, the turnaround time. It can sequence all types of organisms like bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. Also, it has been known to identify newer pathogens which were previously unknown in ocular, causing ocular infections. Just a comparison of the single-plex PCR, multiplex, and clinical metagenomics. I there are it's based on biases, on bioinformatic expenses, on the background noise, and also on the turnaround time, which could vary between less than 12 hours to about a day, 24 hours. A newer technique, a mass spectrophotometry. It is basically a call a accurate quantitative analysis where it uses the MZ, the mass to charge ratio. The ionization technique using the electrospray ionization as well as the matrix assisted laser absorption is used. This could be with or without the time of flight. It can accurately and rapidly resolve pathogens to species and even to subspecies. Briefly, the role of epigenetics in infective keratitis. Interactions between pathogens, cellular factors, it's been used in cases of viral keratitis. Also, as epigenetic modifier that targets the host and newer therapeutic approaches to treat infectious keratitis. It's especially 
useful for viral infections. And few important considerations to be taken is that it is important to decrease the risk of epigenetic instability and abnormality that could result continuously in wide spectrum inhibitors over longer time. Important to focus our research on identifying specific inhibitors rather than a global non-specific inhibitors. So the advantages of molecular diagnosis, yes, a rapid turnaround time, results between hours and days, and in useful for initiating appropriate antimicrobial therapy, which all of us are looking for. High sensitivity and specificity because of the very nature of detecting very small DNA and reducing false positive, which I'll talk about also as a disadvantage. And of course, detection of fastidious organisms, which can it can detect, which are not grown in standard culture media and organisms like acanthomy and certain fungal species. Also, the multiplex, as I spoke of earlier, can detect multiple pathogens in a single test, comprehensive screening, and identification of polymicrobial infections. It definitely is going to guide treatment decisions. It's the way forward for specific pathogens, for antimicrobial resistance, guiding clinicians in selecting the right appropriate antimicrobial therapy, and improving treatment outcomes, and of course, reducing the risk of complication and improving patient compliance. It's non-invasive, tear samples, swabs can be used, and it has an advantage over the more invasive corneal scraping method. But what are the limitations? It is amplifying a targeted DNA sequence based on a specific primary. Only targeted organisms are being examined and analyzed. It can be detected despite for antimicrobial treatment complicating the interpretation of PCR. So are we really there? False negative, absence of the infectious sample not being analyzed, the type of sample being analyzed, the time of sampling is extremely important, and it may fail to detect certain strains due to sequence polymorphs. So there could be a slight mismatch between in, in the primer sequence. And false positives, background contamination. PCR is a very, very sensitive test. It needs skilled people doing it, and it could just be a background contamination, which could just be hampering the results and ever-increasing sensitivities of the molecular assays. Challenges in our country, the costs, the accessibility, the availability, the expert, yeah, just finishing, expert manpower who can meticulously handle these samples and a segment of the DNA, not and not the live organism, cannot quantify the organism load and difficult, important in differentiating between active and latent infection, viable and non-viable cells. The DNA sequence of the suspected organism has to be known in advance to create a suitable primer for its amplification. So I thank you with a couple of slides, pictures captured from the microscope. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Gandhi. Such a nice fantastic. So any question to Dr. Gandhi? Dr. Elmer? Yeah, I mean, this is always a question about molecular diagnosis, I think, is really the issue of false positives. I mean, um, you know, I, I think that it's always a challenge to know, you know, what represents a, an actual pathogen and what, what may be a commensal organism or something that's just an innocent bystander. Do you have um, a sense of what um, how to how to reconcile that, uh, um, Dr. Arpin? I'm not very sure if you have a sense of how to reconcile it because all of them are the multiplex and the other PCR show it, but probably more targeted primers and more uh, research into that could probably be the answer for it. Thank you. Has anybody used uh, this to treat any infant among the panelists? Sorry, I didn't uh, understand no. the question. Breaking so, up for me. Uh, uh, for, the the clinicians, yeah. for the clinicians, has anybody used uh, next generation sequencing? Because I'm afraid of toxicity if I were to see a lot of uh, infectious care agents as a report and not being able to identify what is the causative organism. 
I haven't done it so much, but I I know that there they have projects at uh, UCSF, um, the the Proctor Foundation. They have a number of grants. They have a large network. Uh, They're collecting specimens, but I haven't used it myself. In fact, that's where I got the information from. <laughs> we are using it uh, for uh, viral keratitis, more for that, and uh, not exactly done much for and uh, the other infections sort of. So would your, center, would your center recommend it for culture negative more for uh, not as a not for all the cases but for uh... um, right now I would say we're not um, we're still working on it and uh, the uh, right now what we are doing is trying to find out exactly the molecular tests to be done apart from just DNA sequencing and PCR where we can uh, diagnose but for diagnostic purpose, uh, uh, frankly, we we still don't use it. It's more viral is more clinical. We know that. So even if you're able to add, so it doesn't add much to the knowledge part, if you put it that way. The treatment part doesn't change much on that. Thanks, Dr. Apan. I think we can uh, move sure. to the next talk uh, by, Dr. by Dr. Gemo. Can someone please start the start sharing the slide by Dr. Gemo Amesco? Is hello? I need help for sharing the slide. Yes, doctor. Uh, please tell me. Yeah, you have to share the slides by Dr. M. S. Kua. I'm just. M. S. Kua. So while he is, yeah, just hold on. Stop before start. Then let me introduce. Just hold on for some time. Just hold on. Yeah. So Dr. M. S. Kua is basically a cornea specialist and uh, from Baskin Palmer Institute, Miami. He you, has been um, actively involved uh, in uh, ocular microbiology and immunology group, and he has been uh, instrumental in uh, microbial keratitis as well as ocular surface. So he is a, uh, a fantastic researcher and very fantastic clinician. He is going uh, basically here, an innovative technique by Dr. Parel from Baskin Palmer, and uh, this technique is basically use of photodynamic therapy with rose bengal in the management of uh, microbial keratitis. So he's not live, I checked, but he shared his uh, talk, recorded talk. So we'll take his talk now. You can start sharing, please. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Guillermo Mesqua. I thank you uh, for inviting me. I thank the all Indian Ophthalmology Society for making me part of this um, this um, scientific event. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to share uh, the work we're doing with uh, phototherapy for infectious um, keratitis. Um, uh, first of all, uh, what I've been I'm going to be sharing with you. Many of this is still in the uh, research process, experimental process. We don't have FDA clearance for uh, many of the cases that I'm going to show. And also, and more important, um, everything that I'm going to show is uh, been a complete um, team approach. Um, many people have been part of this and been helping to move this research uh, forward, including um, collaborators in India, such as um, uh, Dr. Bupesh Bhaga, Devi Prasad, and Dr. Um, uh, Prashna at Arabin. Um, we really appreciate all the all the help. Um, we, like many of you in India, here in South Florida, we see uh, cases of progressive infectious keratitis that even with access to standard of care, still progress to uh, severe ulceration and need uh, emergent surgery in, in many cases. Uh, this is data from our lab um, from Dr. Darren Miller. Um, we live in a tropical area where um, many patients get gram-negative infection. That's by far the most common infection we see, but we do see a good number of patients with uh, fungal ulcers uh, compared to the United States by 
We are by far the area that sees the most uh, uh, cases of fungal keratitis. Um, many, may, maybe not as 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 common as in many parts of India, but um, we we do have our share. And I think that this paper exemplifies uh, why we've been working hard in trying to move this field forward. Over the last 30 years, 40 years, there hasn't been major improvements in antimicrobial development. In fact, I think uh, in the last 20 years, it's definitely been uh, a very poor, um, and not many new commercially available drugs have um, come into, into market, at least here in the United States. And it's a shame because we continue to do pretty much the same as we've been doing in the, in the early, as we were doing in the early 70s, this paper from Dan Jones, who was an incredible micro ocular microbiologist, clearly exemplifies that we're still using almost the same diagnostic uh, culture media and uh, slit lab examination and antimicrobials, but I think it's time to think about uh, new therapies. And I think overall we do a good job in patients uh, that have bacterial infections. And I think uh, viral infections, we also, but for atypical bacteria, fungal and parasitic infections, there's still a, a significant room for improvement. The use of phototherapy or photodynamic therapy or cross-linking um, has been already been a study for the last 10, 15 years in the, in the field of ocular microbiology. But there's still not a strong um, prospective randomized data um, uh, that this is something that's here to stay and to help the patients. This is, for example, a paper from the group at Alabin and uh, UCSF um, uh, that showed that it really didn't make a, a, a clinical uh, benefit in many patients um, uh, for bacterial keratitis. It may have reduced culture positivity and some other complications. For fungal keratitis, there's still no, um, no, no, um, no prospective randomized control trial that's shown that uh, cross-linking with riboflavin is beneficial. The group from Dr. Uh, Fahad Hafesi in Switzerland has worked uh, significantly in this field, and uh, they are uh, strong proponents that we have to increase fluence uh, in order to obtain better results in this complex ulcer, such as fungal acantamoeba and some of the more resistant bacteria. Uh, what uh, we've been doing at Bascom Palmer uh, since the start was using the same energy as the Dresden protocols, but we agree with Dr. Hafesi that increasing the fluid is something that is helpful. So um, we tried different photosensitizing agents activated by a light, and we decided to focus on rose bengal. This is almost eight, uh, nine years ago that we've been We've been using this, and the reason we did this is because rose bengal is uh, readily available. At that, time, we, uh, that time, we were using the strips from the clinic, but now we're using a powder and we and we compound the rose bengal. Uh, but photodynamic uh, therapy with rose bengal is something that's been used before in the cornea field for the management of ectasia. Um, we know it's safe for the cornea. We know uh, we have a lot of animal data. We know that increases the um, the uh, the collagen and fiber strength, we know that it increases the resistance to enzymatic degradation, just like riboflavin and, and, and cross-linking with UV light. So there's a lot of data out there that uh, was available when we started this project and motivated us to move forward. Dr. John Perry Perel built this uh, first generation um, light source following Dresden protocol, safety protocols. And we've been improving it and uh, we're now in the fifth generation uh, and that's the one that they have at Arvin at LB Prasad. Um, we've done extensive work on in vitro studies, and we've shown that in vitro we're able to kill Fusarium and um, Candida very well. Aspergill is not as well. Uh, 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 there are some uh, species of Aspergill that are very hard uh, to cure with uh, with Rose Bengal. Um, We've done um, extensive research in, um, in multi-drug resistant pseudomona, staph, but also we wanted to see if this, um, the safety, this is something that FDA uh, asked us to do, and we wanted to test how toxic was this for the corneal endothelium, and it is not because um, rose bengal and non-inflamed cornea, it only penetrates to about one third of the cornea. Uh, so uh, if you compare the right eye and left eye of a rabbit here, we can see that those bengals did not cause endothelial damage. Now, I'm not too worried about endothelial damage in this very severe ulcer. For me, 
stopping the corneal perforation is what really matters. And uh, we know here also with this uh, research publication that we did that it is not toxic for the limbal epithelial cells. Uh, so we mean continue to move forward. We did safety data in rabbits and we showed that it doesn't affect the crystalline lens, the macula, uh, and it doesn't delay epithelial healing. Um, this was a publication in a human uh, on a patient with a uh, resistant fusarium uh, keratitis, and um, uh, the patient did uh, very well after failing medical therapy on a patient that almost perforated. And this uh, uh, was our first publication that um, uh, was a retrospective review of all of uh, consecutive cases treated at the Bascom Palmer Institute. At that time, it was like about five years ago, we were treating uh, only the best, the most severe uh, cases or patients that at least had a failure to medical therapy and the two cornea specialists felt that the next step was surgical management. Uh, we felt, uh, in the, the, the study showed that um, about 70% of these patients avoided the need of surgery. In, um, in our uh, intermediate uh, uh, outcome study, uh, we uh, show uh, what was expected that the patients that we were able to uh, prevent a surgical intervention, and they later on had an optical graft, had a much better prognosis uh, than the patients that uh, failed the rose bengal and required a, um, a graft in the acute setting. The group from Bupesh Bala, uh, LV Prasad, has clearly uh, shown here uh, uh, very well um, that for fusarium, there may be uh, a significant benefit of using rose bengal, but for other more pigmented uh, uh, filamentous fungi, it's still not an option, uh, and the results are not what we expect or we want. Um, we recently had an outbreak outbreak here in the United States of a microcystin pseudomonas uh, from contaminated drops, and uh, we, we had some of these cases do um, receive photodynamic therapy with rose bengal, and the patients that had this were the only ones that were uh, had some uh, vision that was saved. Um, our publication with our nine, nine cases and with genotyping of all these organisms, uh, all the organisms had the same bacteria with two genes of uh, amipenem resistant uh, resistance. So the two the patients that we used, the red BPT, uh, did uh, very well, and this publication was accepted by JAMA and should be out within the next three to four weeks. Um, where are we going? Uh, we uh, develop a uh, by we, I mean the engineers in the group uh, that have no credit on this, uh, the um, John Murray Perel and Jeffrey Peterson um, led this paper and we, uh, uh, our lab created a uh, dosimeter in order to measure uh, very well the amount of single oxygen that's being generated in this way we can study uh, and design our treatments better. We're under an NIH clinical trial right now. Uh, we're very lucky collaborating with Dr. Jennifer Rose at Stanford and the group at UCSF. And we have two groups, one at Arabin in Madurai and Pondicherry, and the other one in Brazil with the Annalisa Hoffling and the Nils de Freitas. And this is a trial that we're hoping to end in May, uh, ahead of schedule, uh, more than 300 patients will be recruited. So far it's 250 to 260 that have been recruited. Uh, and I think this trial will give us uh, very good info. We've been trying uh, other photosensitive aids. Uh, this is experiments in vitro that we've been using, such as methylene blue. The problem with methylene blue is it, it, uh, it penetrates the cornea really fast and it can get into the anterior chamber. It's very toxic to the anterior. Um, other photosensitive agents, erythrocin B, et cetera have been studied, but still Rose Bengal uh, performs uh, better. We're trying to study a better way to deliver um, endo uh, Rose Bengal deep into the corneal tissue. And these are different types of photosensitized agents you can see here that we've been using. And um, the good news is that we can deliver deeply into the corneal Rose Bengal with the use of iontophoresis, just like the, uh, like they do with riboflavin for um, cross-linking effects for ectasia. Uh, so this is something that we're actively studying right now. Um, so in summary, I think we need better treatments for infectious keratitis that I think we all agree on this. And um, for rose bengal photodynamic therapy, I think the, uh, there's still many uh, many things we need to do. I think we need to study um, the photosynthesis penetration. How can we improve that? Um, the correct fluence, the time of treatment, the number of treatments that are needed, and if there are other photosynthesized agents that we can use. I really thank you for your attention.
And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, so uh, as he is not uh, live at present, we can discuss uh, later or if somebody wants to comment on any of the experience. Uh, we would like to know your experience, Dr. Vagya. I think you would be the right person to share the experience here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, we were fortunate to have this technique with us and uh, we have used in um, more than, I think, 30 cases of acanthamoeba now. And uh, so far, uh, the response is uh, good, uh, comparable in the in the with the without PDAT uh, in terms of acanthamoeba if we are treating at an early stage. And uh, basically, the the difference which I am seeing is the little faster resolution and uh, little predictable resolution in cases where the involvement is still the mid stroma. So uh, that is one. And for fungus, as our study has uh, shown that it is matching with the in vitro susceptibility as well, that for fusarium, it is working well. So that that thing is actually working. So cases who are actually anterior to mid stromal and clinically uh, fusarium are actually, uh, if you do early, then the response is quite faster and better. We have not tried in uh, other organisms uh, in, in large samples, so particularly in odd 200 cases, maximum are fungus and uh, 30 odd plus or the canthenium. Dr. Prabhash, can you comment on uh, in those acanthamoeba patients whether there is any uh, scarring involved uh, with the rose bengal treatment? Yeah, scarring is there, but the good thing is, as I recently analyzed the paper, the visual acuity is much better as compared to the cases uh, where the PDAT was not used maybe that will faster resolution. So that is something which is there in resolved cases, the visual equity in uh, eight, 45% cases are actually having better than 20 by 40 or 40, uh, 50 vision versus in, in other cases of our uh, series, around 10 to 12% are only having where the vision, visual equity is 10, 20 by 50. So it means the visual acuity is better and uh, in OCT you are seeing those uh, transition line with the, between the two involved and, and uh, in uninvolved area but still clinically they are much better in uh, long run. So I have patients who have completed more than uh, now one and a half year, two years and uh, result is good in those cases. Is that randomized or is that just historical? Yeah, so those are basically I have uh, taken cases from uh, uh, 18 to 19 and uh, 19 to 20 and then 20 onwards when we are having this. So we matched according to the condition where we are having the like six, six to uh, less than eight millimeter size and less than 300 microns anterior chamber OCT, uh, anterior segment OCT depth of infiltrate. So those cases only we have taken. So this is like 27 cases from those compared with the 18 cases of of this series where everything is matched and those cases only we have seen. So I mean, still... I'm just saying historically, if you look at the uh, visual acuity results from uh, yeah, past, this is historical. it's quite high and it's quite good even with, with medical therapy and uh, in those that don't involve, you know, the, the deeper layers. So, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure. It, it's hard to match as you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, we cannot actually do RCT on acanthamoeba. It's quite not that much common. So that's the only thinking is if we do RCT prospective, probably we'll get to answer in multi-centric. That's the only. You'll be done in 20 years or something. <laughs> yes. So uh, I think we can take the next presentation. I am going to present uh, Dr. Saitri. Are you there? Okay. So I'm sharing my... Yes, I'm there. Slides. Is my slides are visible? Yes. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, so I think everyone knows Bhupesh. I don't need to uh, introduce him. Uh, every, those who came to Bugbuster saw the wonders he's doing with the infectious keratitis, the way he is uh, taking it uh, to a real new, uh, very uh, new heights, I should say. 
and we are all benefited from that and probably this uh, symposium itself is a result of uh, uh, his interest in infectious keratitis uh, uh, he takes very keen interest in microbiology and that's why we are uh, good friends uh, he called me his uh, uh, <clears throat> mentor but uh, i know that i learn along with him uh, with his association a lot of animal experiments we have done together it's very nice to see his interest in that and so let us hear about the um, dalk and pk in infectious keratitis from Bhupesh. Bhupesh? Then we are listening after so many things. I, I don't, I'm not able to present now. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> so uh, I'll, uh, I'll start my presentation. Uh, basically, the topic was DAL versus PK in infectious keratitis. So we all know about the management of microbial keratitis deals with the diagnosis and targeted antibiotics or antifungals and lead to resolution. That is always a wishful thinking, but it's not always happen like that. And it uh, some 30% cases actually do not respond to medical treatment and needed surgical treatment in terms of keratoplasty. And in that sense, we have uh, basically advanced advancement in keratoplasty in terms of lamellar or penetrating keratoplasty. When we say TDLK it means therapeutic deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty versus TPK, TPK's definitely role it's uh, in the eradication of infection, but its limitations are the high rates of rejections, as in any case of pyrethrin keratoplasty, with higher rate of intraoperative complications, along with vigorous postoperative care, and that is the thing which actually limits the role of TPK. That's why we always find try to find out some way where we can avoid TPK. When TDLK came in 2006 or so, then probably the thought was that it will take care of many of the things, but unfortunately not. So the thought was that it will reduce the terms of rejection. It will have a better graft survival, glaucoma, endothelmitis will not be there, but there's always a risk of leaving residual infection. So I always say that if you're planning DALC, the prerequisites are having experience performing DALC for optical reasons and is only in selected cases we, we should perform, like cases which are having anterior to mid stromal involvement. Anterior chamber lens involvements are absolutely contraindicated and it preferred in acanthamoeba, early fungal keratitis, which is quite a questionable value bacterial keratitis and should be avoided in deeper fungal as well as microscopial keratitis. Role of OCT is definitely is a uh, is good uh, tool to decide. As we can see here, that it is uh, many a times give, give us a good uh, mark of infiltrate uh, in, in many of the cases. But in cases which are having necrosis, having a lot of exudates and all, not, not a uh, clinical examination is the most important in those cases. We prefer to use either big bubble or manual. So I uh, divide my technique of doing dark in, in, in these cases. If you're having fungal or acanthamoeba keratitis, particularly center infiltrate with relatively clear cornea with sparing of posterior stroma. This can be attempted big bubble after removal of the infiltrate, but manual technique holds better in cases with a lot of necrosis, bacterial keratitis, or impending perforation or desmetocin. And also as described in this article, which I have quoted, that if infiltrate is extending till posterior stroma, then also big bubble should not be attempted. Like this paper by Donald and group, they have actually compared between the TDLK with TPK. But if you see the sample, this is basically all cases of acanthamoeba actually have undergone DALC versus most of the cases of fungus and bacteria have actually gone under underwent PK. So actually, this may not be a clear comparison between the two group. And based on that, they said that epithelial problems were almost equal in the all the groups, but endophthalmitis is more in TPK group as well as glaucoma and cataract formation. Allograph rejection, as we can expect, is much more common in TPK group. And post-operative DN detachment is exclusively, definitely should be there in a DAL group only. 
But if you see the recurrence of primary disease is 22.2%, even in the smaller sample size. So it's not always without free of complications. In another series by Chinese group, they have compared DAL for fungal keratitis, exclusively for fungal with large sample size, 94 in the DAL group and 161 in the PK. And there they have shown the recurrence is not that much difference, but rejection as well as glaucoma, endothelmitis are much more uh, seen in PK group. So that is one way to show that even if the visual outcome, long-term and recurrent chances are same, but rejection chances and glaucoma and erythematis are less. But if you see the if you see the selection criteria, they are much more anterior to mid-stromal cases. They have also uh, checked the comparison in terms of attenuation of endothelial cell count, and as expected, they have shown that that in dark the, the stability after six months of endothelial count versus in PK, which was continuously decreasing with the long-term survival of the graft as per the group till 18 months was same. But interesting thing is, if you see the species wise, Aspergillus species were much more going for PK versus dark. As you can see in 67 cases of their, their, uh, their series, 50 cases underwent PK versus Fusarium, which we know that it spreads more of, more of uh, originally, the Fusarium species were more common in cases of dark. This is the series which we have published in uh, international in, in general of ophthalmology, where we compared uh, DAL for acanthiva keratitis. And if you see the size more than eight millimeter and less than eight millimeter, we divided in two groups in 10 and 13 cases. And we realized that cases which are having a bigger uh, size are actually do not do that well as compared to the smaller size, where 60% developed graft failure and DMD were seen in 50%. So it is probably a good idea if you're performing DAL to perform in mild to moderate cases rather than advanced cases, which we routinely see in our cases scenario. So seeing this, there is a series of by, by Sarnicola group of early DAL in infectious keratitis. So first series they have published for fungal keratitis, where they included cases only where two weeks treatment and no response, where six millimeter is the criteria and uh, 150 micrometer uh, less than uh, 300 micrometer was the is the involvement, and they have realized that there's no recurrence of infection. If you see the species wise, the Fusarium and Canada were the more common um, species versus Aspergillus was less, but still they could say that 100% survival of the graft and no recurrence of infection. They have also published for Acanthamoeba case uh, series of 11 cases. And they have taken in 30 to 60 days of duration in longer than fungal cases, but the inclusion criteria was same. And they have concluded that there was no recurrence of rejection and recurrence with good graft survival. So this is a case which uh, which we saw here. And uh, in our LVP is a larger infiltrate around eight millimeter with deeper ex with extensions, deeper extensions along with limbal infiltrate. We took the case for penetrating keratoplasty, but as we always try to perform deep anterior lemma keratoplasty in many of the cases. So this case was lucky to get uh, a nice guttering first we make and then nice bubble actually we got it and careful dissection of the anterior stroma and then posterior stroma. We could get it a nice clean DM. This was the good outcome. Not all cases are that much lucky. This is the this is the case of that series where we have seen ten cases, and out of them six got failure. But this is the those four cases which got actually success. This is the second case, which actually is having a little smaller infiltrate as compared to the first case. This have been managed after two and a half months and started central thinning. So this the 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 technique is same. So I will not uh, waste much of time in, in describing the technique. Basically, I'm marking the center and uh, I'm not able to advance the video. So I'll just show another 20 seconds, whatever we can show here. So basically, marking is very important and do not perforate while making trephination is the bowl. That's why I was a little careful in marking. And removal of the 
anterior stroma, basically till the mid stroma is crucial in, in managing cases. As you can see, there's a small gap in the anterior to mid stroma. And after removal of the posterior uh, stroma, the procedure is same, making a pocket and making insertion with the, uh, with the Fogla injector and making the bubble. And after that, the same procedure. As you can see that the bubble has come. So this is the follow-up of most one year. So post-operative care, which is unique to DALC, is the need to look for post-operative residual infection, both clinical, histopathological, confocal, and ASOCT. Attachment of DL and subtle signs of uh, recurrence and need to be picked up with continuation of medication of no steroids. So like this case, which I recently did, uh, I was having actually, an, after that, we are taking, taking some cases so we can continue discussion uh, uh, with this case as well, that this case we did dark nine months history, and after dark we could see that there is small haze for one week. So we could not show that whether this is a still residual infection or we are dealing uh, with the inflammation. The wishful thinking is always when it is your dark that you think about that this is uh, inflammation. We started uh, corticosteroids after two weeks and it really resolved. But after one month of uh, history, the patient came with the haze along with the limbal nodule. At, then, at that time, we realized that we are dealing with, uh, with a recurrence of infection. We did confocal as well as uh, OCT. And we saw that there was a basically gap in the interface with the infiltrate in the desmet. And we performed the uh, PK with the, this patient has completed now one year. Uh, and there's no recurrence. So basically, the, the thing is, if you are performing dial, think about always that patient can have recurrence. If at all certain haze or certain uh, pigments are there, keep a close follow-up. And uh, if you're starting steroids, then definitely it's a mandatory to watch for recurrence. So like this case, we picked up on confocal only where the, the cysts were there, as I said, if you are performing dal code PK, we should be very careful by, by seeing the confocal histopathological as well as clinical examination. So uh, like this is very important as I follow, always follow my dal cases in the canthamoeba or any other infection by doing OCT. This is the first post-op day of the patient. This is the seventh post-op day and this is the 60 days follow-up. So basically we do see DM beta actment in these cases, but all cases do not require desmetopexy. And with careful follow-up and observation without using of corticosteroids, the inflammation is settling down. That's actually key that your patient is out of a recurrence. And this is one of the case of microspedia where we do not advise to use uh, this technique and because all of the patient actually recur very badly like this patient. And fortunately for this patient, that patient uh, did uh, the PK, uh, the eye could be saved. So take home message for, for everybody is that dark should be done in selected cases of microbial keratitis, particularly acanthamoeba, with the big query to fungal keratitis with the previous series showing some good survival, but we do not know. No for microsporidia, as the main goal of surgery is eradication of infection, we need to plan complete eradication. Early dark versus late dark is still a debatable question and need to be customized, I believe. And dark provides double uh, role, good survival, lesser complications, and equal eradication in selected cases. Thank you very much. Is there any question or yeah, comment? Yeah, Bupesh, more a comment or a question. Man. So any correlation with the past pain in... Uh, histopath or anything correlation with the buttons on histopath? Yeah, okay. so uh, the the cases which actually recurred, we see, we saw that uh, that histopathologically was showing a cyst on the on the deeper portion as well as at the cutting edge of of those cases. So, but but surprisingly, not all cases were having uh, those florid. Uh, acanthamoeba as we were expecting in uh, as the recurrence. So more of the inflammation rather than uh, real cyst. But confocal actually showed uh, plenty of cyst in, in, in these cases, in those, these two cases. So that and is if, uh, one observation. 
and the inflammation was acute chronic or was it mixed and anything on that yeah the more of neutrophils acute inflammation. okay thank you uh, just a question and uh, dr bupesh in the case where you did a penetrating keratoplasty after the dalt uh, was it the same size or a little big because uh, it was a bigger uh, one it's a bigger, bigger one. The dark was, yeah. Yeah. because i i cut the section of the histopathology and saw the cyst was there in one of the section particularly the superior uh, temporal which we are seeing the haze was coming so there the extension was there and uh, i took 13 millimeter size and uh, that's a probably reason that patient developed later on glaucoma and needed agv as well so uh, that is one thing so that can happen. We need to take a little larger size. Dr. Elmer, you have any uh, comment or experience to share? Um, I mean, I, I think one of the things is that if you look at those studies for DALC, obviously the prognosis is going to be good if the disease is limited. I mean, that's, I mean, you could do it in epithelial disease and do, you know, a, a transplant yeah. and they'd be successful. So um, I think it needs to be worked out at some point. I, I know that there's a move towards earlier transplantation, but I think that many of those patients did well with DALC would probably do well with medical therapy as well. So we need to figure that out, exactly what the criteria are. And that's going to be a difficult study to do, but I think over time, we'll get a better sense of uh, which ones will benefit from early transplant and which ones uh, would benefit from medical therapy. So Dr. Paras did a very nice uh... Uh, one of the case and she shared uh, with us um, dark in uh, fungal keratitis. So Dr. Paras, you have, want to tell about that case? Yeah, in fact, I would uh, agree to Dr. Tu that we have to take that call based on case-based depending yeah. on uh, how much is an involvement in when your medical therapy fails and you would like to intervene surgically. Uh, in in I've done a couple of you know uh, cases uh, taken for uh, dal for th uh, therapeutic purpose. Generally, that is decided based on as the previous studies mentioned that you know if there is an involvement you know, of the stroma, anterior stroma, or up to mid stroma, and, and there is no plaque onto the endothelial surface, and the uh, uh, like you know the microbial keratitis is not responding to. Uh, full-fledged medical management. Those are the cases when they are taken for therapeutic graft. I've just done manual layer by layer dissection and seen up to what level uh, you can see that there is reasonably uh, clear cornea underneath the infiltrate. That based on that, like, you know, I mean, con keeping in mind that there is a possibility of recurrence. I've done a very large diameter graft somewhere around 9.5 to 10 millimeter. And, uh, uh, some of them have done very well. And usually the steroids are started very late in these cases. Oh, you have the video here. I'm just uh, trying to uh, show the steps You, if you are describing it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. In fact, this was a very young chap, 21-year-old uh, male patient, and he was not at all responding to antifungal management, as you can see here, that I planned a large diameter graft, but then I, we started therapeutic graft, penetrating graft, but we started dissecting layer by layer and reached up. Sometimes what happens is when you do a big bubble, uh, uh, sometimes the central portion is having some corneal edema and it can lead to perforation into that area. So somehow I've ended up doing manual, though it is not recommended, especially in fungal keratitis, but I mean, I could get away with the uh, like procedure and then we could we did not have any recurrence in this patient and histopathologically it was proven that the last layers of it was all the layers were sent for histopathological pathology evaluation and the uh, last layers of uh, stroma did not have any fungus into that so, and we i started the steroids very late like you can wait for a longer time and then put these patients on a low dose steroids and see how the things are and then go ahead with uh, the further management. So uh, one, one question. Uh, just one second, Dr. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Maria, you can uh, share, start sharing your screen. She has uh, some interesting cases to uh, discuss. We have uh, some 12 minutes to discuss these three cases. Yeah, Dr. Meena. 
So, Bhupesh, that case which had developed a nodule, had you done a big bubble or did you do a manual dissection? Just, manual. Uh, I, I forgot. Manual. manual. So, they, it doesn't mean that if you do big bubble, you will have more recurrences. No, uh, uh, there's no difference uh, as per the studies and as per our experience, whatever limited experience we have, some 30 cases. So, but as, as per the paper which uh, quoted by Dr. Uh, Donald Ten group, they have said that if you are making big bubble or cases from Chinese group also, the big bubble, the recurrences are less because those cases also are early and uh, you if you are able to get the, the big bubble, basically the posterior stroma is not involved. So that's the basically uh, one of the major to say that. But I, I do believe that if you are doing big bubble, actually you are taking off entire piece of stroma, maybe that is the reason of lack of recurrence. This case was actually having a lot of thinning and nine months of uh, recalcitrant acanthiuba keratitis uh, of around 30 year old girls. So that's why I took a decision to go for DAL, but could not get the big bubble, not, not able to find out. Thinning was quite extensive in this case. So Maria is a senior fellow, senior cornea fellow, and she's going to uh, take through some interesting cases of uh, diagnosis as well as management challenges. Maria? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bupesh, for giving me this opportunity to present here. So I'll be discussing a few cases uh, related to the talks that we've had previously. So my first case, uh, uh, just one second. Yeah. So my first case, a 25-year-old male who came to us with, with complaints of redness, pain and watering since about 20 days. Uh, he had no previous history of similar episode and no history of trauma either. And on presentation, his visual equity was 2020. So as we can see in his left eye, there was this focal area of corneal edema along with presence of keratic precipitates and endoex endoexudates, which were also located in the area of edema. So this was a, we thought was a characteristic picture of HSV endothelitis and started the patient on uh, oral Acevir five times along with topical steroids. So just uh, we asked. Hold on. Yes, so I think uh, just you take the case from here. So uh, any of the panelists want to comment that, do you agree with the diagnosis uh, of HSV endothelitis presenting like this? and go for this thing, or you want to investigate further before embarking on corticosteroids, considering that you do not know anything about the case. Or Dr. Tu, if you are here. Well, I mean, uh, the only concern I have is that there seems to be uh, some stromal infiltrate in addition. So that would be, that would give me some pause. So be interested to know about uh, any history of exposure, any, you know, what the, I mean, it sounds like her vision's quite good. Mm. Uh, was the patient on steroids at presentation, Dr. Baka? Uh, no, no ma'am. No, patient was not steroid, on steroids and the anterior stroma was completely uh, epithelized and there was no entry point, no history. We could we have seen these type of cases without any anterior stroma or any um, any scratch on the epithelium without any incident history with quite corneas with quite conjunctiva and eye, so that's why we thought of this maybe HSV endothelitis. Yes, Maria. Yes, sir. So we asked the patient to review again in two weeks. Uh, however, when he came back at the second visit, as we can see, the lesion had actually increased compared to the first visit. And now the area of edema along with infiltrate had increased and the KPs were also dispersedly uh, distributed now. Uh, however, the patient said that he had not used the oral medication and we attributed this increase to his not using the medication. And so we stressed the compliance and asked him to review again in one week. So this is his picture when he came back one week later. And as we can see, the uh, endoexudates have now become denser. And uh, as and we can see also a focal area of satellite lesion now, which is located here. So now my question to the panelist, what next? This is a patient who is a suspected case of uh, clinically looking HSV endothelitis, who is on oral acevir along with steroids, but however, he's been worsening. So now how would you approach this? Is Minister your case amenable to scraping? Uh, not from the anterior side. It's not yet involved the anterior stroma. 
no, no. Uh, you can see the reflex of set lamp, which is completely posterior. Uh, Dr. Elma, you are telling something? Oh, I mean, this is an ideal situation for the confocal, uh, I think, uh, and an OCT if you want, but uh, I think the confocal would be helpful since you have yeah. no access. Uh, Dr. Bupesh, would you like to do a deep biopsy or an endoscraping for such cases before? Yeah, so uh, that is the thought because the session is based on the diagnosis and the management. So we thought of doing confocal and uh, endoscraping and biopsy. And uh, Maria, you start. Yes. So as we can see, also there was an area of thinning, which can be seen here. So we went ahead and did corneal scraping and also performed AC tap from the increase in the endoexidate lesions. So from the corneal scraping, uh, a microscopic evaluation revealed uh, septate hyaline fungal filaments and also few budding yeast were also noted. Uh, while the AC tap showed us again septate hyaline fungal filaments. Uh, this AC tap was also sent for PCR analysis, which came out to be positive for HSV DNA by conventional PCR. Uh, the culture later revealed growth of uh, Pyceliomyces liliacinus. Uh, this is post the AC tap. Uh, however, the lesion was still increasing. And this is when we decided to go ahead with pen, uh, uh, planning a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. Dr. Sharma or Dr. Gandhi, uh, do you uh, have you come across like case where the PCR of virus is also positive and fungus is also coming positive? Yes, yes. Positive? yes, yes. We yes, have. yes. We have come across. So I think this is one of the cases where the combination of infection, but initially what was to start with, do not know. Yeah, that uh, what you're seeing, the chains of Ingram stain, Yes, chain of uh, cells, uh, that's not yeast actually. Uh, it's, it's not real budding. It's, it's no, it doesn't seem septate. like budding. You yeah. can see septate. This is just yeah. a septate film. I mean, very yeah. closely septate. But it's a very beautiful picture. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Savitri. Any Jimza was done? If you add the material on it. Now we don't do regular. They have stopped doing Jimza. Only gram and calc. Why have you asked uh, any, any, any viral cytopathic changes were seen, any type of inflammatory cells? I mean, if you had a deep uh, uh, scraping done, so maybe you had enough material. Too. And because HSV was positive. And HSV, yeah, correct. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bhupesh, one question. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, did you do ASOCT on the first visit? Do you think uh, it would have helped? Uh, to differentiate if there's an endothelial plaque like lesion, it could either yeah, be. Uh, uh, yeah, this initially, uh, I think I could not see this case in the initial uh, two visits, but uh, the change of management probably is the first is uh, whenever we see the another protocol is whenever we see only endothelial exudates and mid stromal infiltrate, always do confocal ASOCT as well as. Uh, sclerotic scatter examination. If you find pinhead lesions or some scatter on scatter examination, this is more of fungus before starting corticosteroids. So this is a learning from like these type of cases when we go through, as you correctly said. Dr. Bhupesh, could this have been to begin with a viral keratitis and secondarily got infected with fungus because of uh, starting of steroids? It could be like that as well. Uh, possibly, but uh, this type of cases we have uh, now seen and they are presenting like that and particularly species like this, I realize are causing deep stromal infection to start with. I do not know the reason why it is always. So probably that is the reason, Dr. Paris, or, but do you think that corticosteroids is only cause? And it causing no, no, it could have been it could have been a combined pathology also to okay. begin with, but yeah. there is other thought yeah. as well that yeah. if a person is put on corticosteroids and secondarily the patient got infected with fungal infection and or maybe sometimes a bacterial. Definitely is a mixed infection, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, Maria. So this is the patient uh, post-operative uh, one day where the, as we can see, the graft is clear and there's no area of residual infection noted. And he was started on amphotericin B along with uh, oral uh, fluconazole along with as acevir. 
This is his six week picture where we can see the eye is quiet. There were some pigments which were dispersed over the endothelium and there's no focal area of uh, resi uh, re uh, residual or reinfection noted. However, this is three months later when he presented to us with anterior chamber filled with exudates and a B scan was also performed which did show echoes and hence the patient was planned for an AC tap along with vitreous biopsy. The AC tap did reveal fungus on smear and again, the same species was grown on culture. So now the patient was again planned for a therapeutic with a larger graft and intraoperatively a plaque over the anterior lens capsule was also noted. Hence the uh, lens was cleared, PC was left intact. And this is his picture five months later when there's no recurrence and he's doing well. However, because of the end of and the multiple uh, intravitreal injections, his vision is still of hand motions. Thanks, uh, Maria. I think this is the interesting that it recurred after three months. Now, when we are thinking to uh, write this up case that we are having only posterior stromal and you're all doing very well, thinking to plan for cataract surgery, he suddenly came for routine visit that my cataract has burst. Then we realized that something is, else is going on. But surprising, the button didn't grow anything, neither in the histopathology uh, or uh, not in the uh, basically everything from the AC. So either is this fungus is there in the angle or behind the coming behind the iris, we do not know. Or the lens is involved, which we have missed while doing the penetrating ketoplasty. Yeah, Bupesh, I had a similar case recently of a fusarium that okay. occurred three months later and then actually persisted for a year. We finally were able to get control of it, but it was, uh, I mean, there were no signs of inflammation. Uh, and we actually proceeded with a, an elective cataract surgery. And she showed up a month later after the cataract surgery with a hypopian, which was... Oh. Yeah. So it's... Uh, I think it ha it hides in the iris or in the yes. angles. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, doctor. So, uh, Dr. Subha or uh, any organizing team, if there, is there any time available or we are done? Uh, the stipulated time is still 125, sir. Okay. However, if you wish to continue for uh, five more minutes, I think that should be fine. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Maria, you can continue the next two cases. Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is another patient, a 52-year-old male, who came with history of injury to the left eye with a towel. As we can see, clinically, he had this uh, dry-looking white corneal infiltrate, which was around mid-stromal, and uh, he had, which had hypated edges. And also there was a central epithelial defect. Uh, we scraped this patient. However, uh, there was very scanty sample that we could achieve. And hence his uh, microbiological evaluation also came out negative. So now what next for this patient? Will we continue on empirical therapy or start antifungals? Because clinically, there is a strong suspicion of, uh, of this being a fungal keratitis. Or will we start him on cocktail medication? This is a question to the panelists. How would they proceed? Any uh, any comment by Dr. Tu or Dr. Manisha? On focal microscopy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, confocal would be the first thing which I would like to do. Unfortunately, we still don't have it here. So uh, for that, I would suggest I would say that I wouldn't start antifungus if it's still coming out to be negative, and there is a lot of material already which was there for scraping. So I would initially start only with empirical therapy and would like to wait because, I mean, you we actually do not know and wait for the cultures to grow. Empirical means uh, antibiotics, combination yes. of antibiotics. Yes, combination of antibiotics and wait for the cultures and uh, maybe review very yeah. early within a 48 That's hour. Right. Repeat the scraping if the cultures are not doing anything. <laughs> yes, yeah, so fortunately we are having a uh, confocal microscopy and uh, Maria. Yeah, so uh, yeah. This is the picture on confocal. Since the microscopic evaluation was negative, we went ahead and did confocal. And as we can see, multiple hyperreflective linear branching uh, filaments were noted, which confirmed our diagnosis of fungal keratitis. And we started the patient on antifungal therapy. And this is about two weeks later when the lesion had completely scarred. So this is a similar case, a patient who came with history of a dust particle fall into his left eye about 10 days Sorry, back. Sorry, what was the learning in that case? Yeah, so learning is basically two-edged. If you are having a strong clinical suspicion, either, as Manisha said, 
do re-scrape because still some infiltrate is left or it may be possible the scraping was not done properly or the second thing is if you are having a strong suspicion do confirm with another method of diagnosing it by using of confocal method. i think the the importance of the person doing the scraping here is should be i like it i think non representative material could have been a cause also many, especially when you, when you see the confocal uh, picture many reasons uh, dr arpan yeah. sometimes yeah. it is a little deeper and you're not able to get the real Correct. organisms yeah so the so probably a conversation that this could be possible also yeah thank okay. you second second yeah so this is another case was uh, treated as viral keratitis elsewhere and on presentation he had the cellularity in the uh, anterior stroma and a characteristic radial keratoneuritis like lesions which were also noted however there was no foci where we could scrape from and hence uh, we still tried to take material from the area of cellularity uh, however microscopic evaluation was negative and so we went ahead and did confocal for this patient as well which helped us uh, see the hyperreflective uh, round uh, lesion uh, round uh, focal uh, lesions which was suggestive of acanthamoeba cyst and then this patient was started on anti acanthamoeba treatment and this is him after 2 months of completing the anti acanthamoeba treatment where his lesions had completely resolved Uh, Dr. Bupe, should I continue? Yeah, so I think time is up. So uh, as uh, Sobhav said, there are five more minutes. So I think that these two two cases basically are uh, showing the importance of con because the session was on diagnosis and management. That's why I kept these two cases where early diagnosis could save the diagnosis, could save many times second fever could not be picked up on smears because of any reason. So we should have strong suspicion and do this modality as well. Any comment, final comment by any of the panelists or uh, uh, speaker? Dr. Elmer, still you are awake? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just want to thank you for including me. This is um, it's, uh, a wonderful way to spend a Saturday night, Sunday morning. <laughs> thank you so much. You can conclude now. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Sobha, you can uh, conclude now and... Uh, all uh, speakers, please switch on your camera so that we can take a picture. Who is taking? Uh, we have a technical support guy who will do it, sir. Thank you so very much for such a wonderful discussion. It was uh, enriching. Though I'm not much into cornea or infective keratitis, I thoroughly enjoyed the session. Being a passive listener to all these wonderful talks. And thank you all for joining in and uh, spending your time so peacefully and well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much.